Worlds Without Number by Kevin Crawford. Wait, what? Cobalt Crawford made another system? No, Gator, that's the wrong Crawford. Anyways, this system is what I originally wanted to cover when the OGL mess happened. I jumped to Pathfinder at the time because I thought it would explode in popularity, but it turned out it didn't go anywhere. So instead, I'm gonna cover something that interests me. Screw the algorithm. Welcome to Pack Tactics. I'm super excited to cover this. This is brand new territory. Disclaimer, by the way, this is not a review of the system. This is just how you create a character, but to explain the system a bit, this is an old school renaissance like game, but thicker with modern tabletop game design and streamlining practices. It's very player run, as in the DM will be reacting to what the players do. This makes the world feel open and very alive, and I love that. It's one of the reasons why I play tabletop games, so that's why I'm interested. But Kubold, what's the setting like? The best way I can describe it is it's distant future, but everything is in ruins to a point where modern civilization civilization is basically back to the Dark Ages. This is sword and sorcery with a lot of mystery in it. But you don't have to use the setting. I know a guy who runs Forgotten Realms, except he uses this system instead, so you can do whatever with it. Anyways, let's begin. This is a free version. It's missing some rules, but it's not much. If you like this video, then I recommend you buy this book to support Crawford. Sorry for the long intro, by the way. This is what the character sheet looks like, by the way. And here is the character creation on page four. Unlike other books, this just cuts to the chase. It's two pages long, and if you know this, then you also know how to create a character in Stars Without Number as well. That's a sci-fi game by him. Anyways, I'm just gonna make a character. By the way, don't let the length of this video intimidate you. When you know what you're doing, you can make a character in five minutes. I'm not gonna bring up magic. Magic will be another video. Here we go, step one. Roll six attributes in order or assign them from an array. We're familiar with those, but in case you're not, here's what they do. I'm just gonna use the array. I'm making a warrior, by the way. That's a class. Step two, mark down your attribute modifiers for each score. Here they are. This is a system shock for us 5e and Pathfinder players, but the way this tackles the martial caster divide is very interesting. Step three, pick a background from the list on page 11 and note down any particular details you decide for it. You gain the free skill listed under the background name at level zero. Then here at the background, the bottom part says, if you want a background not listed here, work with your GM and choose growth and learning tables that fit your concept. That's nice, you can make your own background, but I'll pick Hunter. My character concept is Steve Irwin. Let's put a picture here. There we go. Here's my free skill. It's shoot and now it's level zero. Shoot skill says fire a bow or crossbow or throw a hurled weapon. Maintaining ranged weaponry and fletching arrows. Step four, pick one of three options below. I'm going to pick the middle option, the two skills from my background. I want sneak and notice. Notice is like investigation. Here's the whole list, by the way. You might want to pause it and read it yourself. There's a cap in skills and attributes. We know the attributes one. The cap there is 18. That's a plus two modifier. But in character creation for skills, your cap is level one. You can't go higher than level one. As you progress in your class levels, you can eventually get a skill level four. That means you're the world's best. Here it says, every hero can at least attempt to do almost anything, whether or not they're particularly expert at it. But a hero with the right skills will have a much easier time finding success with their efforts. Skill checks, the player rolls 2d6 and adds their relevant skill level to it, and the modifier of their most pertinent attribute score. If they have no relevant skill at all, they subtract one from their roll. So yeah, I can try to perform by playing the piano, even though I have nothing in the perform skill. But that means I have a minus one to the roll. Then I apply my attribute, like charisma, that's another minus one, so my roll is 2d6 Six minus two. Not great, but I can do it. But Kubold, 
Do you roll a d20 for attacking? Yes, it's different from skills, and that's fine. By the way, some things can't be attempted unless you have a high enough skill level, like forging full play armor. But before we continue, this video is sponsored by the Ethereal Expanse Setting Guide. Sail your ship across a magical sea of ethereal liquid. This is an epic setting for D&D 5e. It's over 200 pages long. Tons of lore and adventure ideas for your campaign in this alien world. Tons of new player options, including 12 new subclasses, new magic items, and many brand new mechanics like the Heritage Trait system, which allows you to build your character species with over 50 different traits to pick from. And best of all, ship rules! You can build your own crew, upgrade your ships, and have ship combats! Kobold, we can be pirates! That's right, Gator. Instead of yip, we say yar. Yar. Lastly, there's over 30 new monsters to murder with your ship. The Ethereal Expanse is coming soon on Kickstarter. Stay tuned for an adventure that's completely out of this world! Back to the video! Anyways, next. Step 6. Choose your class. Warrior, Expert, Mage, or Adventure. Adventure is a mixed class. Everything explains itself, but Mage has different subclasses like High Mage, Elementalist, Healers, Necromancers, or Vowed. I want to make a warrior. Kobold, what the heck? This only goes to level 10. Gator, in D&D 5e, the game is only good at level 3 to 10. So this is fine. Okay, let me quickly roll HP. Oh, I got a 6, plus 2, that's 8. Plus 1 attack bonus, there we go, and we get 2 focus picks. That's basically feats, but feats also have levels. Like, if you pick the same feat twice, then you have a level 2 feat. And these feats are surprisingly really strong, and I love it. Look at alerts, it's stronger than the 5e version. Don't get me wrong, the 5e one is strong, but this is even better. Oh my god, I just saw this now. Look, you can get an AoE feature as a marshal, that's unheard of in 5e. I've been asking for an AoE feature like this for years! And you can get it at level 1, what the heck? Poisoner also looks super fun. Sure, you can kind of do the same thing in 5e, but not through a feat. And you would need a really liberal DM in order to do stuff like this. Here's Arms Master. Shock damage is really cool. Basically, if the creature has a set AC, you could do automatic damage. Kind of like half on the save spells, but weaker. Like in this example, it says if the target has 15 AC or lower, then you do 2 damage. If you hit the creature and do damage, and it's less than the shock damage, then you just use the shock damage instead. Anyways, we're gonna visit all the combat rules in the next video. The focuses I'll pick are level 1 and 2 Deadeye. I want to use crossbows, I think they're really cool. But there's more, I also get two features for free. That's right, we have more features than a level 2 fighter in D&D 5e, and it's awesome. Let's read them. Killing Blow. Whenever a warrior inflicts damage with any attack, spell, or special ability, they may add half their character level rounded up to the damage done. This damage is also added to any shock they may inflict. And then we've got Veteran's Luck. Once per scene as an instant action, the warrior may turn a missed attack they have made into a hit. Alternatively, they may turn a successful attack against them into a miss. Also, as an instant action. We're gonna talk about snap attack in the next video. We've already done step 7. 8 are other playable species. You can make your character into such a creature by spending a focus pick on the appropriate origin focus. This is an optional rule. In the free version, I found them on page 311. There's dwarves, elves, halflings, gnomes, goblins, lizardmen, and orcs. Works. Remember, this costs a feat, but it says the DM might hand it to you for free. It's also really easy to make up your own species with the DM, like kobolds. 
Step nine, pick one skill of your choice. Okay, I pick riding. I like mounts and tabletop games. Step 10 and 11 is magic stuff. We're gonna talk about that in another video. Step 12 and 13, we already did. Step 14, choose one of the equipment packages on page 29, or all 3D6 times 10 to find out which starting silver pieces you have with which to buy gear. I'm just gonna grab a package. I picked the ranger pack, but I'm gonna cheat a little bit and replace the bow with a crossbow. Cool, what the heck? Stop cheating! Yeah, guys, don't tell Reddit that I'm cheating. This is our secret. Armor. Normally, casters can't cast with armor unless they have armored magic focus. If you have no armor, your AC is 10 plus dexterity. If you're wearing armor that's equal to or better than a shield, then the shield grants a bonus plus one AC. Shields also allow the bear to ignore the first instance of shock they might otherwise suffer in a round. Remember that. That's important. If you're wearing medium armor or heavier, you get a sneak penalty of whatever the encumbrance is. So if you're wearing scaled armor, then the penalty is three. If you're wearing heavy, then you also have a penalty to exert. Exert is basically running and swimming and stuff like that. Not only does heavy armor provide more AC, but it also makes you immune to shock damage. Keep that in mind. Moving on, here's weapon rules. Using a melee weapon without at least stab zero skill inflicts a minus two penalty on hit rolls. As does using ranged weapons without at least shoot zero skill. Throw weapons can be used with either. Ranged weapons have both short and long ranges listed in feet. Attacking a target within short range may be done at no penalty, while hitting a target at long range is done with a minus two penalty to the hit roll. Two-handed ranged weapons cannot be used while an enemy is locked in melee with the wielder, but I have dead eye, so I ignore that. Anyways, one-handed or throw weapons suffer a minus four penalty to hit in such circumstances. Some weapons have additional unique traits, like subtle. I I can hide my dagger in normal clothing. By the way, I forgot this particular attribute relevance to the weapons used. That attribute modifier is applied to all hit rolls, damage rolls, and shock inflicted by the weapon. You know what that means. Anyways, I care about crossbow. Reloading a crossbow of this size takes a full main action, but due to the simplicity of their operation, someone without shoot zero can still use them at no unskilled hit penalty. Anyway, Anyways, I'm not gonna read all the descriptions, you could do it yourself. Here's the weapon list, you can even get guns if you have enough money for it. It's obviously super good. I'm using a crossbow, so that's 1d10 damage, I use the dex attribute and have a massive range. Here's all the weapon traits, crossbow is two-handed, but remember I have dead eye, so I can shoot a melee. SR is slow reload, it takes a main action to reload. Dead eye helps me here too, I can reload as an on-turn action instead. On turn action is kind of like a bonus action or a swift action. PM is precisely murderous. When used for an execution attack, the weapon applies an additional minus one penalty to the physical save and does double damage even if it succeeds. We might as well read it. Here's what it is. It takes a minute to set up the prep to do an execution, and then once done, my range attacks requires a dex shoot skill check against a difficulty of six for a point blank shot. 8 for 1 at weapons normal range, and 10 for a shot at extreme range. If the execution attack hits, the target must make an immediate physical saving throw at a penalty equal to the attacker's combat skill level. If they fail, they are mortally wounded on the spot, or knocked unconscious if the attacker was using a plausible, non-lethal weapon. If they succeed, the weapon still does its maximum damage, but because I have PM, they have a minus one penalty to the save, and if they succeed anyways, the max damage is doubled. So yeah, this is super duper good. Next, step 15, 16, and 17 is done. Step 18, note down saving throw. Physical saves against poison, disease, or exhaustion are 15 minus the best of your strength or constitution modifiers. Evasion saves to dodge sudden perils or dive away from explosions. 
options are 15 minus the best of your intelligence or dexterity modifiers. Mental saves to resist psychic influence or mind-bending sorceries are 15 minus the best of your wisdom or charisma modifiers. Your luck save is a flat score of 15 and rolled against when only blind luck can save you. Wait! Kobold! Why would you want a low score in these saves? Good question. Here we go. To make a saving throw, the subject rolls a d20 and tries to roll equal or higher than the relevant saving throw score. Oh, okay. Yup, and now we're done with character creation. I think we hold the speedrun record on YouTube now. Yay! Speedrunner! I'm going to read the quick preference sheet for you before ending the video. Next video will be about actions, hopefully. I'm just gonna read the bullet points I missed in this video. Skill checks. The easiest checks are difficulty 6, most are 8 plus, the most difficult are 12 plus. Bad or good circumstances or tools can apply up to a minus 2 to plus 2 penalty or bonus to the roll. Allies can aid their own skill use at the same difficulty, granting a plus 1 bonus if any helper succeeds. Combat rounds. A combat round lasts about 6 seconds. Here we go, this is really important. At the start of combat, each side rolls initiative once on 1d8 and adds the best dexterity modifier on their side. The highest rolling group goes first, ties goes to the PC. The third bullet point here is an optional rule, it's for individual initiative rolls. Anyways, on their turn, in the round, a creature can take one main action, one move action, and as many on-turn or instant actions as the DM thinks reasonable. Main actions are attacks, spellcasting, or other activities that would eat up most of 6 seconds. Move actions allow the PC to move 30 feet or do similar short, simple actions. On turn actions allow the PC to say a few words, drop prone, or do other reflexively simple things. Instant actions can be taken at any time, even during someone else's turn, or even after dice have been rolled. Instant actions are usually special powers the PC can use, or the result of holding an action in combat. Hitting and damage. A roll of 1 always misses and a roll of 20 always hits. The wielder's attribute modifier and any shock specific damage bonus are added to the shock damage done. That's really important, you should remember that. Shields negate the first instance of shock that a target would take each round. The total defense action makes the target immune to shock for the rest of the round. A successful hit can't do less damage than the weapon's shock would do on a miss. Injury and healing. A creature dies or is mortally wounded at zero hit points. Minor NPCs, PCs with frail quality, and creatures hit by unsurvivable injuries die instantly. Others are mortally wounded and die 6 rounds later. An ally can stabilize the mortally wounded with a dex or int heal check at a difficulty of 8 plus the number of full rounds since the target was felled. Stabilize creatures stop dying and revive in 10 minutes with one hit point and the frailed quality. Creatures lose the frailed quality after magical healing or a week of bed rest. Magical healing stabilizes and revives a mortally wounded PC with no frail quality applied. First aid after a battle heals 1d6 HP plus the healer's heal skill. This can be done multiple times, but each use adds one point of system strain to the target. A creature's maximum system strain is equal to their constitution score. And if maximized, they can no longer benefit from any effect or healing that would add strain. A creature that is not frail recovers their level or hit dice in lost hit points after each good night's rest and also loses one accrued system strain point. Everything except for system strain is obvious. Here is system strain. A character's maximum system strain is equal to their constitution attribute. Thus, someone with a constitution of 13 could accumulate up to 13 points of system strain. And now it basically explains itself. If you're still confused, just read the whole thing. 
Spell casting. Casting a spell takes a main action, one free hand, and the ability to speak in a clear voice. Spells cannot usually be cast while wearing armor or holding a shield. If a caster suffers damage or is badly jostled, they cannot attempt to cast a spell for the rest of the round. If the caster is struck while actively casting, they lose the spell slot and the spell fizzles uselessly. And there we go. You should be able to play the game now, in theory. Kobold, what do you think? I love it so far. I really want to play this. This video was really fun to make too. I'm gonna try to continue with this series. I really hope that's possible. If you really like this video and want to see more, please share, like, and subscribe and all that. This is not a popular system like D&D, so it's not gonna do well in the algorithm. And so, I need your help. I hope you had fun. Anyways, end of video. Bye-bye! Bye-bye!